A couple months ago I offered $500 to any Muslim who could prove one simple Quran verse to be true. Sadly, no Muslims taking me up on this offer. Aww. So I'm back with a new challenge and I'm doubling the stakes! That's right, Reason Answers has passed a thousand subscribers, so I'm offering a thousand dollars to anyone who can prove the truth of a different Quran verse. Stay tuned to learn more about that. More on that challenge in a moment. But first, some announcements and thank yous. At 1,000 subscribers, YouTube unlocks the community post function. I'm excited about this because it'll allow me to keep you up to date about my future projects and share occasional thoughts that aren't worth making a full video about. Keep an eye out for that supposedly being enabled within the next week. I want to thank all the Muslims who have posted on my channel. A few of you have posted thoughtful comments and engaged in legitimate conversation. This is appreciated and encouraged. Others of you have left hate-filled drivel, but that's okay too. Such comments tell me three things. One, you can't intellectually defend Islam. Two, this fact bothers you. In other words, your hate alerts me that my videos are effective. And three, and most importantly, your hatred shows me how much you are in need of the love of Jesus and it motivates me to keep fighting against the satanic powers that consume you without your knowledge. I'm praying that over time you realize that I'm right and you leave the religion that makes you hateful, embracing instead the true God who loves you completely and unconditionally. In time-honored YouTube tradition, let me now read some of those comments. Your video is too long and I can't get through everything. Not a particularly creative or interesting comment, but it was my first ever insult posted within 24 hours of my first video release. This reply came after I called his bluff that he had watched the video before commenting. I ain't no blah blah. My brother, I don't know why you're feeding people with false information. Go get educated, brother. If you don't like facts cited from academic sources, then they're false, obviously. Answering this video, do you suffer from anxiety as your breath went away and you can't sit still? Also, take that smirk off your mug. That's not actually an answer, but I don't suffer from anxiety disorder. Thanks for asking. Sorry about smirking. Sometimes Islam is just too ridiculous to talk about and maintain a straight face. Go back to sleep. Wow, real zinger there. Oh rubbish, you're trying to deceive people and you're considering yourself an expert. Whoa. Misused commas, four punctuation marks to end a sentence, and a missing space. I'm guessing your expertise is not in topography. The piece of shit in this video is a, is liar, a con artist who's deceiving people by ruining the image of Islam. I'm glad there's people out there that see the truth. He's a fraud. When asked about verses from the Bible, he lies and says it doesn't exist or misinterprets the verses. These devils all share the same trait. I agree. All devils are the same. The one that squeezed Muhammad in the cave, the one that told him to marry the wife of his own adopted son, and the one that tricked him into revealing the satanic verses. All the same devil. It's obvious that you haven't t -t read the old Bible. I already give the clear Bible chapter and verses. It's obvious also that you are one of those Christian priests or scholars that Christian cannot trust because of misleading. It's true. I haven't t -t read the old Bible. Whatever that is. You are a disgrace to humanity. It's awful to keep talking to you. Please release me and do not reply to me. You are pure evil to me. Oh, sad. Your posts get angrier and angrier with every video. Just give it up already and stop trying to defend Islam. And finally, a positive comment from a Muslim turned ex-Muslim that makes it all worthwhile. Let's just say I find your and generally the Christian arguments persuasive and am sailing in your boat currently. I'll leave it at that. 
In the event you're watching this video, my friend, know that I am praying for you. Now a few quick thank yous before getting to the contest. When I started this channel a little over six months ago, I had no idea what to expect but set an ambitious goal of a thousand subscribers in the first year. Obviously, that goal would be exceeded easily, but I couldn't have done it without your help. Thank you, Chris Becca, for translating several videos into Indonesian. Thank you, Endtime2016, for translating several into German. Thank you, Light of All Nations, for your translation into Arabic. Thank you, Lucky Dodo, for cross-posting a few videos with Chris's subtitles. Thank you to everyone else who has cross-posted my videos. Thank you, Sneakers Corner, for collaborating with me on several videos. Thank you, everyone who has posted my videos on social media. I don't know who you are, but I know you're sharing because I see views coming from Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and so on. And thanks most of all to Islam Critiqued for encouraging me to start this channel and giving me my initial batch of subscribers by interviewing me. I'll put links to all these channels in the pinned comment. If you know of anyone else who has translated or cross-posted my videos, or are interested in doing so yourself, let me know in the comments or drop me an email. All of my content is freely licensed, and I have English transcripts that can aid in translation. Now, on to the main event. Surah 930 declares, The Jews say Ezra is the Son of God. The Christians say the Messiah is the Son of God. That is the utterance of their mouths, conforming with the unbelievers before them. God assail them, how they are perverted. Whatever this verse means exactly, it is obviously claiming that Jews view Ezra in the same way Christians view the Messiah, which in the Quran is synonymous with Jesus. One possibility is that the Quran thinks both Jews and Christians believe God fathered children in the ordinary sense. That would explain how they are conforming with the unbelievers before them. This theory would align nicely with several Quran verses which condemn similar ideas. For example, Surah 6, 101. The creator of the heaven and the earth, how should he have a son, seeing as he has no consort? And he created all things, and he has knowledge of everything. Indeed, that may well be the best explanation. Ibn Kathir, for example, saw it this way. Allah mentions the misguidance of those who were led astray and claimed a son or offspring for him, as the Jews did with Ezra, the Christians with Issa, and the Arab pagans with the angels whom they claimed were Allah's daughters. Allah is far holier than what the unjust polytheist people associate with him. The problem is, this isn't a viable option for modern Muslims, since it is obviously wrong about Christian belief, let alone Jewish views of Ezra. As such, let me be generous and give Allah the benefit of the doubt, and say that he knows what Christians mean by the Son of God. That is, that the God of the universe became human in the person of Jesus. This would mean Allah thinks Jews believed Ezra was likewise God incarnate. If the Jewish people ever believed this, there ought to be some solid evidence, so here is the challenge. Produce any document or physical artifact that predates the Quran and describes the Jewish people worshipping Ezra, or the more literal Arabic Uzair, as Yahweh, or God Almighty. This is, after all, what Christians clearly believe about Jesus, and the Quran says the sin of the two groups is the same. Do that, and a thousand dollars is yours! See the pinned contest rules for full legal details. If the Quran is true, this should be easy. We have hundreds of documents consisting of tens of thousands of pages documenting Jewish beliefs from before Muhammad's time. If this was a widespread belief, surely one sentence at least in all of that would mention it. It is inconceivable that no Jewish writer would ever mention such an important belief in all their explanations of the Jewish faith. We also have Christian polemics against Judaism from before Muhammad's time. Perhaps one of those writers mentioned this blasphemous belief in their attacks. We have hundreds of Jewish inscriptions and artifacts known from archaeology. Can you find an example of Ezra worship among these? When you can't find anything, you're going to want to come up with some excuse. Indeed, the claim that Jews said Ezra is the Son of God is so obviously false that some Muslim translators have 
adjusted what the Arabic says. For example, Yusuf Ali's translation makes the subtle change. The Jews call Uzer a son of Allah. Using the Arabic Uzer is fair enough, but there's no justification for substituting the indefinite a son of Allah for the definite the son of Allah. He seems to be trying to make it sound like two different claims are being made, but the parallelism is obvious in Arabic. The Quran uses the exact same words to describe the Jewish claim about Uzer or Ezra and the Christian claim about the Messiah. Muhammad Sarwar goes further, making the English read, Some of the Jews have said Ezra is the son of God. There's zero justification for inserting some of into the text. This is just outright deception on Sarwar's part because he knows the statement as written in Arabic is false. Sorry guys, this sort of deception simply isn't going to cut it. Muslim translators aren't alone in realizing how false this statement is. Non-Muslim academics who have a hard time believing anyone could have been so dumb as to make such an obviously false claim have proposed all kinds of explanations. Unfortunately for Muslims, all these theories lack solid evidence and none does anything to remove the air. They simply seek to explain its origin. Some have tried to amend the text, saying the original Quran contained a different but similar sounding name. Arabic scholar Paul Casanova suggested it should read Uzael, which he tied to the biblical Azazel of Leviticus 16.8. In later Jewish writing, Azazel is called the leader of the fallen angels, or sons of God, but that hardly explains why Jews were supposedly revering this figure. Various other suggestions have been made, including Azariah from the Greek version of Daniel, Aziz from a misreading of Psalms 2-7, and even the Egyptian god Osiris. All these solutions both lack manuscript support or other hard evidence, and also destroy the Muslim belief of perfect preservation of the Quran. So these aren't options for Muslims. Several scholars have proposed that Uzair was some sort of composite figure, a combination of Ezra from 4th Ezra, also called 2nd Ezra's, and Enoch, as described in 2nd and 3rd Enoch. Middle Eastern Studies Specialist Gordon Newby, for example, writes, It is easy, then, to imagine among the Jews of the Hijaz who were apparently involved in the mystical speculations associated with the Merkabah, Ezra, because of the traditions of his translation, because of his piety, and particularly because he was equated with Enoch as the scribe of God, could be termed one of the Bene Elohim. And of course, it would fit the description of the religious leader, one of the Abar of Quran 931, whom the Jews had exalted. This theory has some appeal in that there is strong evidence that Muhammad was influenced by Merkabah mysticism. There's also good evidence that the Arabs were familiar with these texts, and elements of them make it into Muslim commentaries on the Quran. Fourth Ezra speaks explicitly of the Messiah being God's son, and says Ezra will be brought to the son, showing how it is possible Muhammad could have confused Ezra and the son when hearing the story orally. In the end, however, Nubi's suggestion is inadequate. Note that he says, it is easy to imagine meaning there's no hard evidence for this association, just speculation that it was possible. Early Muslim commentators show no awareness of this connection, despite using the texts in relation to other verses of the Quran. Elsewhere, early commentaries betray knowledge of the Jewish sources underlying the stories in the Quran by filling in details found in the original source, but not contained in the Quran itself. That doesn't happen here. We see attempts to tie Uzair to the biblical Ezra through speculation of him receiving exalted status for restoring the Torah, but no use of 4th Ezra or any other Hebrew text to justify the Son of God claim directly. When faced with obvious problems like this, many modern Muslims try to use the falsity as proof of its truth. They argue that if such an obvious error was real, then early critics would have used that argument against Muhammad. This argument is extremely poor in general. Opponents aren't experts on the Quran and don't necessarily know every last verse. Plus, Muslims are known to have burned non-Islamic texts as blasphemous, so much of the opposition writing has been lost to history. 
It is an especially poor argument here, as we have many records of early critics using this exact verse against Islam. Ninth-century Muslim scholars such as al-Jahif and al-Qasim bin Ibrahim al-Rasi write about encountering the argument. Al-Qasim admits frankly that he had never encountered a Jew who believed Ezra was the son of God. Al-Thalibi of the 10th century relates that it was well known in his time that no Jew had such a belief, but claims that if even one Jewish leader had ever said it, then the guilt would apply to all Jews. Sheikh Tusi in the 11th century likewise admits he knows of no evidence of this belief, but makes the same nonsensical argument as modern Muslims, saying it must be true since the Jews who heard it from Muhammad allegedly didn't deny it. Early tafsir struggled to explain the verse as well. Al-Tabari reports conflicting claims on the meaning of the verse. He first says that there was only one Jew named Finhas that said this, but then he says on the authority of Ibn Abbas that a group of Jews, not including Finhas, came to Muhammad with this claim. The contradiction is clear evidence that Al-Tabari's sources were probably making things up in an attempt to justify the verse. Nor would such stories actually explain how the all-knowing God of the universe made such a mistake anyway. Ibn Kathir declares that the statement is universal and reflects the ugly battles which they fought against the people of the faith, but then admits that not all rabbis actually make the claim. It is important to note that while these early theologians admit the belief was common, they still try to make it apply to all the Jews in one fashion or another. This is because they understood the grammar of the Quran demands a universal application. In other words, they were struggling to explain how a belief that was obviously not universal, or even common, could somehow impart universal guilt, as the Quran claims. Let's take a step back and look at the context of Surah 930. Context is always key to interpreting the Bible properly, but doesn't always help with the Quran, as it is often disorganized and put together in seemingly random order. However, here I think it helps. Much of Surah 9 is attempting to justify Muhammad breaking existing treaties with the polytheists of Arabia. 928 concludes the justifications for why Muslims should fight the polytheists. The famous 29th verse serves as a pivot from talking about the polytheists to non-Muslims in general. Fight those who believe not in God and the last day, and do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden. Such men as practice not the religion of truth, being of those who have been given the book, until they pay the tribute out of hand and have been humbled. Verse 30 then provides the justification for this fighting. Jews and Christians are both guilty of committing shirk, that is, associating partners with Allah, just as the unbelievers who lived before them, the polytheists whom the surah is primarily about. Verse 31 provides further justification or clarification lest anyone doubt that the Jews and Christians did commit shirk. They have taken their rabbis and their monks as lords apart from God and the Messiah Mary's son, and they were commanded to serve but one God. There is no God but he. Glory be to him above that they associate. Verses 30 to 31, then, were written as an ad hoc justification for the declaration of war against the Jews and Christians, rather than as a condemnation of actual beliefs. Quranic studies scholar Manam Suri explains, I would argue that if we understand the Quranic statement as polemical, perhaps the problem of inaccuracies can be put aside. As is well known, polemical writings are intended not only to prove one's own viewpoint, but also to disapprove others' views, even to the point of distorting descriptions as to make them unacceptable. I agree. The statement is polemical, but not factual. The simplest option is that the writer of the Quran simply made up the statement, either wholesale or after hearing some Jews talking about Ezra as a son of God in the generic way that any Jew can be called a son of God. A more complex explanation is that it derives originally from Samaritan polemics against the Jews. It is well known that Ezra was seen as a falsifier of scripture in Samaritan thought, possibly leading to mocking statements about the hated Jews revering the supposed false prophet. 
Arabic professor Jay Walker suggests. If the idea did not germinate in Muhammad's own mind, and since it is quite alien to Judaism, it is obviously a slanderous accusation made against the Jews by their protagonists. I would suggest, therefore, that perhaps the libelers were none other than the old enemies of the Samaritans, who hated Ezra above all because he changed the sacred law and its holy script. There is some evidence of the Quran borrowing from Samaritan ideas, and Al Tabari provides some interesting support. Remember Finhas? Well, in the biblical book of Ezra, Finhas is listed as an ancestor of Ezra. He also plays an important role in Samaritan theology. Al Tabari's alternate explanation for the verse mentioned previously declares Four men came to the apostle of God and said, how can we follow you when you have abandoned our direction of prayer, Kibla, and you do not claim that Ezra is the son of God? Because of what they said, this verse was revealed. This is especially interesting because there is nothing about the Kibla in the context of 930. Historian Hava Lazarus Yafe suggests that this is an example of the commentaries betraying the underlying sources. Both Ezra and Finhas are negatively associated in the early Muslim Quran exegesis with Muhammad's change in the direction of prayer, Qibla, from Jerusalem to Mecca, and this may be a faint echo of the Samaritan arguments against replacing the sanctity of Mount Gezerim with that of Jerusalem. She then cites a later Samaritan manuscript that appears to conflate Ezra and Finhas as further evidence that this sort of confusion is what the Quran is pulling from. Like all theories discussed, the suggestion lacks any hard proof, but the multiple shared name certainly is interesting. Arguably, this is the best of the speculation we've seen, but it does remain speculative. Whether taken from the Samaritans or invented by Muhammad, we have a simple explanation for Surah 930. A human author used it to justify war against the Jews, not really caring whether it was true or not. The claim that the Jews call Ezra the Son of God makes perfect sense if the Quran is nothing more than the work of one or more human beings. It does not, however, make any sense if the Quran is divine in origin. Surely the all-knowing God of the universe would not, in his heavenly tablet written for all people before the creation of the universe, attribute a belief to the Jewish people that no one ever had, or at best, a statement said by a few random Jews who lived during the exact time when Muhammad also lived. Muslims, I urge you to seriously consider the implications of this statement, and not simply dismiss it. If the Quran is wrong here, it cannot be the literal word of an omniscient and benevolent God, regardless of the polemical value of the false claim. Knock the peg of a divine Quran out, and Islam crumbles quickly, as there is not really any historical evidence of its truth. If the Quran is not divine, Islam is false. Abandon the God that makes false claims to justify warfare, and embrace the true God who loves you deeply. Thanks for watching.